our oceans are depleting, our, our lands are depleting, our air is depleting. If we don't take that call, especially in countries like Thailand, where let's say 25 to 30 percent of the GDP is based on tourism, which is directly proportional to hospitality and food and beverage industry, we will be we will be left behind and Mother Nature will uh, shower its wrath upon us. Bunker Kosla is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas. DK, uh, or Deepankar Kosla, affectionately known as DK, is as passionate about reimagining authentic classical Indian cuisine, which he likes to call Neo-Indian, as he is for achieving food sustainability. Haoma is his dream come true project, a wonderful restaurant in Bangkok that began with an online course in aquaponics and just a year later had bloomed into a full-blown functioning urban farm in the heart of Bangkok. But it was a year of toiling the earth, coaxing fish to grow in new waters and of experimenting through many trials and errors to optimize flavors, all the while working to create a food system that can truly be called sustainable. DK's commitment to the environment is contagious, and so is his drive and passion to deliver excellent cuisine at Haoma, Bangkok. DK, welcome to the show. It's so great to see you. How are you? It's a pleasure to be here today and uh, to be uh, speaking with you about things that we truly love and uh, push forward. I'm uh, pleased to be here, doing great, uh, not uh, as good as we could be with the virus in our back doors, but uh, we, we, we are happy to be surviving and with God's grace, we're doing very well. Thank you. Thank you for asking. I hope you're doing good as well. I'm doing most excellent. Thank you. It's so good to see you. Just for our listeners, we know each other. We first met, I believe it was in 2019, at the Sustainable Brands Chumpon, I believe That's it was. Uh, the Sustainable Oceans. Yeah, we did the yep. Sustainable Seafood Manifesto together. We were actually at the same table and, and kind of yep. had this workshop on the Seafood Manifesto. And so You've been doing this for quite some time. You've been a chef for a while and you're really thinking about new ways of, of, of food and, and sustainability has always been a focus and uh, on your lips. We've, uh, we're surrounded at sustainable brands, Chumpon, uh, with this, the oceans theme and the, the seafood manifesto by numerous chefs i mean there was a tables full of of chefs and people there who really top of their class but they were all concerned about a couple things health uh, uh, of our food systems and sustainability how we can get back to regenerative and organic practices how we yeah. can include the environment and things you've been in this space for a while and then bam the entire world was hit with all sorts of craziness, not just the pandemic that we're still yeah. living through, Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, crazy inauguration um, um, in the gastronomy industry, horrific uh, issues around businesses being able to stay open, survivability, a lot of issues with our food systems. And I really truly want to know, one, how did you really weather? Did you weather yeah. the storm and all this experience that you had um, over the years trying to be resilient and sustainable and pr provide good food and do it in a way that's in, in alignment with circular economy principles in our earth? Did that prove to be a better model for you? And um, how did, how did you weather all the other craziness that's still coming and, and, and how, are, how are you doing? What, what were the learning lessons? I know some of them, some of the very good and positive things that you did for the community and are still doing, um, yep. but I want to hear all about it because I'm sure there's a lot of good, bad, and ugly learning lessons and some things that we want to hear about. 
Definitely, definitely, Mark. So as you know that uh, uh, I've been cooking for the last uh, 14 years and uh, sustainability is not a buzzword for me. It is the way of life. Every single day uh, with uh, multiple restaurants and multiple employees going into uh, hundreds, uh, there is decisions for me to make. There's right decisions, there's wrong decisions, but I always choose the sustainable one. And for me, uh, giving back to the environment and uh, working with nature, not against nature, is something that is a part of my life. And uh, that is what I have been raised with since I was a little child living in a small town in India called Allahabad, which was the first in India to ban use of plastic, to having a small uh, kitchen garden it right in the backyard of our house where we would fetch our tomatoes and chili from once mom had already prepared dinner. So uh, it's just uh, the small lifestyle that I was raised in and I've scaled it to all of my businesses. As you know, uh, once COVID hit and it came like a like a storm and it took all of us, uh, blew all of our roofs away. And uh, we were lucky that uh, we were already in the realms of working with uh, sustainable farmers, working with a uh, 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 population in Thailand that was already pretty awake. And uh, uh, other than home, I also run a business called NutriChef, which is regenerative nutritional diets for people. Uh, who buy subscriptions and eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner with us. And uh, that kept us going. However, Haoma was closed as a part of the lockdown, so we turned it into a soup kitchen, and we started uh, No One Hungry, which uh, you know that uh, we uh, uh, have been able to serve over 170,000 people. Uh, we, If you see the meals that we distribute, we distribute them in banana leaves. We did not compromise on our ethos. And uh, we took the produce that was rotting in the farms that the farmers could not get to the people uh, in restaurants so that it could be cooked in fine dining or in fast food. We turned it into meals that would then be delivered to people who had lost their jobs. Migrants, especially from Myanmar, Cambodia, Nepal, who had lost their jobs in the pandemic. We focused on them and we are doing that today. As we speak, we distributed 500 meals this afternoon to a, to a Pakistani refugee community in Nongchok in Bangkok. And uh, we kept going through that. Uh, there's a lot of lessons we learned. Uh, first and foremost, the lesson was uh, utmost resilience. No matter what happens, you do not let the burners in your kitchen go out. You cook. As cooks, that's what we can do, right? So we cook to make sure that people are fed. And uh, cooking in the restaurants of our standard, uh, the kind of level that we are at home and counted in top restaurants in the world, it's not just only about how fancy the food looks in your plate. And as you know, we work with United Nations uh, GAIN, which is the Global Alliance of Nutrition, to be able to fortify rice and bring it out to people so that they could actually cook at home, cook for the homeless, cook for restaurants, but uplifting the nutrition of what they are putting in their bodies. Because for me, as a chef, it's not about how many Instagram likes my dishes get. It's about what, how your body, your mind, and your soul is nourished by what I'm putting into your body. So that was one of the biggest lessons that we've learned. We are uh, resilience. And uh, the second biggest lesson that we've learned is that in the world that we are leading in, into, one stream of revenue is not going to be enough. Because you never know what, strikes you what lightning strikes your restaurant and it gets blown away so you've always got to diversify and you've got to have the resilience and perseverance to pivot in the time of crisis and use the crisis as an opportunity to help yourself your people and the society at large so a lot we've learned from uh, the pandemic as of now that's so beautiful and it's uh, really a model, a better model for reaching the future, a better model for resilience, because you have that sustainability, but that stability in, in tough times to be flexible, to pivot on a dime, to go from being a, a, a wonderful, very sustainable restaurant to serving meals to people in need. And what we're seeing all over the world is that businesses and organizations are really starting though those ones who have the right business models for sustainability and environmental social governance yep. to provide planetary services social services towards yes. the health of their communities and environment and to give back and as they give back not only does it build more resilience but it also builds new 
sources of revenue streams, new sources of security, new sources of sustainable supply chains and things. Uh, I, I want to back up a little bit because I know that, that you've been working on a lot of meals and helping. Um, at Sustainable Brands, we were brought together by Dr. P. Nui, who is a wonderful uh, friend of uh, both of ours yeah. and, and did a lot of things. And she also wrote a contribution in my book, Menu B. And I'm hoping to to talk to you about getting you, your contribution as well with all the wonderful things you're doing around the world and representing those much needed people uh, in the communities that you serve. But I, I want to go a little bit deeper into Hooma and I want you yeah. to explain to me, what does sustainability mean to you and, and how is your restaurant sustainable? And I know it, it kind of started with the aquaculture course but it yes. is metamorphed into a wonderful regenerative yes. uh, 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 restaurant. Yes. So, Mark, as you know, uh, and uh, I, I still remember uh, at Sustainable uh, at Sustainability Brands Ocean Manifesto, we were having a cup of coffee and we were having a chat about this, about uh, where being sustainable and uh, zero waste is not a checkered box for Haoma. It's not something that you tick off and you keep moving forward. It's something that we strive for. Like that's the basis of employment in my restaurant. Like if you want to join me as a sous chef, I don't take a cooking trial. I give you a questionnaire or 20 questions of how you can make this world better. And uh, cooking is uh, a skill that you always have. Empathy is something that has developed in you over the years. And I think empathy Sustainability. Okay, so let me first uh, uh, throw some more light about sustainability. So sustainability for me is not just about uh, getting vegetables that don't have chemicals in them. Okay, the idea of sustainability is a lot bigger. Sustainable environment, sustainable employment, sustainable society. That is the realms that we work on together. Uh, the No One Hungry program was an initiative of the Sustainable Society. If I did not go out there today, and feed all of the migrants that had lost their jobs. When I open my restaurant again, where is the kitchen porter? Where is the dishwasher? Where are the line cooks who are going to be doing our butchery? So to be, a, and not just for me, but at large, the entire industry uh, is based on them. Uh, the Mexicans of the US uh, F&B industry is the Burmese of the Thai F&B industry. And we had to go out and they are, most of them, not supported by the social security system of Thailand. So when the plug was pulled, they were the first ones to go dead. So uh, we then reached out to them as a part of our sustainable society. Then we're talking about sustainable environment where we said, OK, enough uh, of uh, this greenwashing where you say, OK, this produce is organic, USDA certified, so on and so forth. However, the guests are never able to really know where the produce came from. Because in your one hour, two hour dinner at a restaurant, you do not have time to inspect all of the produce. So we, we said, why don't we bring the farm on the premises of the restaurant? So we started then growing 2000 fish in rainwater uh, in a city that gets 155 mm rain in a month. We have enough rainwater to work with. So we started working with the rainwater. We grew, started growing produce in the restaurant. And then the question came, okay, we only have uh, 120 square meters of space left for the farm. I was like, okay, let's go vertical then. So I made six stacks and that gave me 600 square meters of space. You know, it's going to be, it's about what, how hard do you want it? How badly do you want it? How badly, how much do you love Mother Earth to be able to care about her? And that is what the ethos with which we went in there. You know, an idea that seemed so alien, so weird to the people who were constructing our restaurant, to the people who wanted to market our restaurant, our PR agencies in the first go, was like, this is prime real estate. Mark, I'm located 750 meters from what is known as the city center of Bangkok. You know what real estate is like in, in the metropolitan Asia. So, I could have easily gone ahead and put 40 or 50 more seats if I used the right marketing, did the right photography on my Instagram and Facebook. I would have filled those seats up anyway. But it's a commitment, man. You know, the commitment to be able to wake up every single morning and say, no, if I don't get this produce today, I'm going to change the menu. I'm not going to compromise and run to the supermarket and buy some Australian carrots because my Chiang Mai farmer cannot provide me the carrots today. 
You go ahead and you start from scratch and you start redoing your menus. That is the level of sustainable commitment that we have. And then came the question of how can we take this sustainability and bring it to the masses. That, that's when we went ahead and started working with GAIN, which is the Global Alliance for Nutrition at the United Nations. We started working with the biggest conglomerate of Thailand CP. As you know, I'm now serving foods in 7-Eleven, which are fortified with that rice, fortified meals with folic acid so that they can uplift the vitamin B12 complex deficiencies in mothers in Thailand so that they can have better children. And that's the level that we took. We took a global uh, giant that was shamed for its plastic use to come to the level where it is now being known for selling fortified nutritional meals. That is our commitment to sustainability at Hauma. I absolutely love it. You also have a very strong waste-free commitment and also have some tools uh, on hand to uh, yes. pur purify your own water through different... Um, options there so you're really trying to do um restaurant to fork you're you're, you're doing a, a lot of it in-house and you're you're taking back control of of the production and you're sourcing as much as possible um, in-house which i love as a chef unless you get that okay i say i'm i'm cooking clean and healthy food how can i cl cook clean and healthy food with unclean and unhealthy vegetables i need to know where my produce is coming from and it has to be ethical and in this in this in, the, in this world that we are living where agriculture is not equals to yield i don't believe in that i believe agriculture equals to nourishment uh, we are now living in a world where agriculture and farming is done for yield and yield only with those big boys coming in and, and commercialization and industrialization of farming. Seed banks have been taken away from the farmer. Fertilizer use has been taken away from the farmer and land as it was seen has been cut into so many small parcels that they don't really control nothing. So that is why I have gone back and started controlling that. And with the help of Food Made Good, which is globally known as one of the largest sustainability audit companies, we've been able to see a tunnel that we were walking in was pretty dark and then they gave us a torch in our hands. They gave us an entire guideline of how we should be able to do what we are achieving to do and custom made that for us. And that is why we are doing what we're doing in Mark. My commitment is that in a couple of years, as we speak today, I am already jotting all of this down. I want to be able to present this to people. Okay, you want to go ahead and open a restaurant? Please go ahead and do that. But make sure that what is going to happen to your gray water, what is going to happen to your waste? What is, so this now has to be a commitment that comes in at the governance level, saying if you want to open a restaurant, all these things need to be taken care of. You open a hotel, all these things need to be taken care of. Because our environment, as you know, is depleting. You've been speaking about that for n number of years. Our oceans are depleting, our, our lands are depleting, our air is depleting. If we don't take that call, especially in countries like Thailand, where let's say 25 to 30 percent of the GDP is based on tourism, which is directly proportional to hospitality and food and beverage industry, we will be, we will be left behind and Mother Nature will uh, shower its wrath upon us and we'd be left with probably nothing. So it's a selfish commitment for me to say, I'm going to work towards nature and nature is going to provide to me. Because as a chef, if 20 years from now, there is no produce left uh, in the ocean, what the hell am I going to cook on my seafood Wednesdays? You know, so it, it's something that I need to start thinking about today. And I'm ready. Uh, my commitment now is that I'm going to package this entire model that I've created in the last four years at Hauma as a prototype of the restaurant of the future and give it out to you. You can give it to anybody who's looking to build a restaurant in the future. I really don't want to go and patent this or trademark this. I'm not that guy. I, this is something that can help the industry at large globally. And, and I'm glad that I have been empowered to be able to do that. And I'm happy, very, very happy to share each and every element of it. I'm so glad. And I, I know you're that way. Um, you're basically saying, please go out and make the world a better place. Here's a better model. Uh and it doesn't need to be patented or trademarked to make the world a better place. I actually think those type of processes not necessarily make the world a better place when you patent and trademark something. 
Um, yes. It actually it limits those who can uh, take it up and use it. And so um, the more people that are doing that, the better it is for you, the better it is for your customers, but also the better our entire industry uh, of gastronomy, of food, regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming um, goes and how we can advance forward into the future of, of food where we really need to be. We need to globally reform our food systems and how it works so that we stop destroying it because it's the greatest cause of human suffering, health problems and human suffering, malnutrition, overweight, obesity, health yeah. issues, but also environmental problems, which are just making things worse. Absolutely. Absolutely, uh, Mark, you know, like I always mention this and if you uh, look, ahead, look at any of the talks or uh, podcasts that I've done recently, I always try to raise this voice that we are currently the world, if you look at the amount of agriculture and produce that we are producing is 1.3 times of what total consumption of the world is going to be. However, we have in this world almost 25 to 28 percent of our population going hungry. The distribution of the produced food is just not right. And that is why coming back to saying, first, the idea of patents and trademarks. If, uh, if, uh, if a 27, 20, like when I was opening my restaurant, I was 27 years old. If I wanted to do a sustainable restaurant and I wanted the blueprints of it, if I, if, if I went ahead to buy a patented idea, I would have to shell hundreds and thousands of dollars on that stuff. It then becomes so commercial that I go like, okay, uh, screw it. I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to just do whatever I think is right. Similarly with farming, uh, similarly with the produce, similarly with like today, if I want to do zero waste, I have to go ahead and buy a software from a, a company that costs me hundreds and thousands of dollars a year. So how would a small business be able to incorporate that? And it's about the small businesses, mate. There is 15 five-star hotels and there is 50,000 standalone restaurants. You know, so the 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 grassroot level, as we call it, the grassroot level is is the smaller players, and we need to be able to impart this knowledge and bring this technology and bring these ideas and these these set of guidelines to them to to that level, not just keep it fancy and make it a part of your corporate social responsibility by greenwashing everything else and nobody else can see it. Just sweeping it under the carpet and getting done with it. So that's why we go ahead and, and work the way we work, Mark. I absolutely love it. And I'm, I'm so glad that you, you brought that out because it is very complex and we talk about systems a lot. So um, when we talk about food systems, the reason we do that, it's not just about food waste. It's not just about growing food. It's not just about farming. It's not just about, um, how we cook and process that food. It's about all of those food systems working together in order to make a restaurant work, in order to make a farm work. There are so Absolutely. many components and facets of this complex system that we need to understand, but that's okay because that's how our world works. Our that's world right. works. I lost your image there. Okay, there you're back. Yeah. Uh, that's just how our world works is in these complex systems. And we really yep. need to make sure that we understand that everything in our world is systems and that we can understand systems. The minute we start yep. breaking them down into silos or into a linear view is when we yes. get into the problem. The, the solution Absolutely. comes when we make sure we're addressing all of that to solve the problem. And that's what I see you're doing in um, Paloma and, and your restaurant and in the other projects you do. You have, uh, and I think we'll tease that now, you have something pretty exciting that you've also started and, and begun working on. It's a, a circular economy regenerative farm to help support the restaurant and your other projects yes. as well. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, uh, so leading up to everything that I mentioned just now, uh, Mark, uh, what the idea is that as, as I was telling you, the seeds are controlled, the fertilizers are controlled, 
the produce is controlled, the land is controlled. There is so much centralization that has happened by big call, uh, companies. I don't want to go ahead and uh, do some name gaming. However, we all know who these are and they are controlling this. And then hence for controlling the entire food system as we're talking about. So I am going ahead and I'm disrupting that in Thailand. We've already started and we are making making the first decentralized blockchain-driven farm where you can actually come to my restaurant and you can scan your omelet and you'd know where the egg came from. And you'll be able to see the entire life cycle of that. The entire farm is not uh, a VC or a venture capitalist-driven. It's not a bank-driven. It's about hundreds and thousands of us coming together, putting a small crowd fund together to be able to eat healthy and feed our children healthy. And we are starting that. We just started with 3,000 uh, layer hens. So we'd be doing around 3,000 eggs a day. Uh, we are following that up with another 2,000 broiler uh, chickens, uh, which is going to be every 45 days uh, around 3,000 kilos of meat. Uh, this is all pasture lay raised and this is all uh, grass fed. And uh, then we are going ahead and we are getting around 12 cows. This is not going to be for meat. This is only going to be for uh, dairy and dairy products because most high quality dairy and dairy products are all imported from Australia or in France. And this is what is causing large amounts of carbon footprint. So we are going ahead and disrupting that. And then we are creating around in one acre land around 17 greenhouses and we will be growing produce for CSA, which is community service agreements. You can join us and we will be serving you top quality produce that nature offers today. Not you wanting to eat a black carrot in January when it does not grow. So we'd be going ahead and doing mass education for people to be able to understand that that what it does it really take and to avoid any kinds of confusion we will be sending people along with this produce with your milk your eggs your your butter your cream your vegetables your cauliflower tomatoes your carrots we'll be sending you recipes of me telling you how to cook those that produce so we are then creating an entire food system and people who want to join can join in with as less than as as less as 250 dollars I want to make top quality food accessible to everybody. And that is what we are going to do. And every single week, we are going to have a farmer's market where people can come who are a part of the CSA and pick up whatever produce they want to pick up and feed their children and their husbands and their mothers and their daughters with top quality, great food that should be accessible to all, not wrapped in a plastic laying in a section called organic in a supermarket that don't you don't dare walk to because it's three times more expensive than what you would get otherwise so i am going ahead and i'm disrupting that mark and that that's a regenerative organic farming practices about 30 kilometers outside of bangkok uh, and, uh, because we were doing with farms in chiang mai and that's all almost 700 kilometers away. So we will be reducing our, uh, our carbon footprint by 670 kilometers every three days. That's around 1,500 kilometers a week. That's 6,000 kilometers uh, a month and 78,000 kilometers of driven diesel trucks for a year. And, and it's also much better farming practices, which uh, is something that that we learned at uh, Sustainable Brands Chumpon is yeah. really in a big push we're trying to get more regenerative farming and a lot more organic farming practices within city limits but also in thailand period because those practices haven't been much used and so now with your standards of quality you're very concerned to make sure it's truly regenerative truly organic absolutely mark and that's why we are putting it on a blockchain so that it's completely truly exposed you can actually at any stage of time see the soil composition, the water that's going in, the fertilizer that's are being put, what are the vitamins, nutrients, minerals that are being given to the chickens, what are they really being fed on, what the cow is really eating. At any stage of time, I am happy to expose this because when you are true to yourself and you're true to Mother Earth, there is nothing to hide. And yeah. we will expose all of this right there so that people can have that faith and take the leap. And we will be the first ones bringing precision farming techniques to Thailand, which is much required. The world has already learned those things 
Japan and Europe and, and different parts of the Israel are already so much more forward on this stuff. We want to be able to teach the farmer here that how can he maximize his output from a single piece of land without taking away from the land. And that's what we are looking to do. So I know when I was there in Champagne, it was also a very bad time as far as the air pollution goes. And people had already been wearing face masks for about three months within the city limits yeah. of, of Bangkok proper. And uh, we were a little bit outside. So we were lucky that we didn't have to yeah. wear the mask and it wasn't quite as bad, although it was, it was also uh, felt there. That has since with the, the pandemic and other things has, has also gotten a little bit worse because of the pandemic where we're wearing more masks as well. Yes. And, and Thai, Thai people have that natural social distancing in yes. any way because of their hospitality uh, and, yes. and the numbers are getting low. But there's something that, you know, maybe I want to tickle upon a little bit. The COVID, the pandemic has a strong tie to food and agriculture and health. It has a strong tie to air pollution and how it's spread. It has a strong tie towards um, not just healthy eating, but how we grow our food, what kind of chemicals and pesticides. If we're burning our crops in between uh, harvests um, and what that does to the air, but also to the biome of our earth and, and to many other things. And so because of that, I, I kind of want to see what your thoughts or feelings are, how as a restaurant or as a food producer, as a chef, are, yes. are you starting to think about not only healthy, nutritious ways to help people strengthen their immune system, but also of ways to purify our air purify the way you produce and make products so that yes. we're actually leaving the earth or those areas where our restaurants our homes our things are better than we found it so that we're kind of being an example to others to clean up that air to clean up the way we live absolutely mark and i think we had a small chat about this when we were in Chumpon, that while the city was running at 165 170 parts per million of uh, of uh, pollution Haoma and the vicinity where we have done planted over 18,000 plants since we got there, it was running at around 130, 120, which was an acceptable range. So that is something that we have, like our landlord, when he comes to the place and he looks at it, he's just in awe. He's like, what have you done to this place? And planting trees is something that we have been doing at Haoma, as I was telling you the last time as well. Every single diner that comes to the restaurant at the end of the meal, Whatever food has he has eaten, we take the food waste and compost it and give you a seed and that waste to take back home. That's your that's your takeaway. And then you can plant that uh, seed and the and your food waste and then plant a tree. And imagine we get around 700 to 900 diners a month. That's 10,000 trees planted by people just coming to eat at Hauma. And that is something that we want to be able to do with now coming to the... Uh, offset from a restaurant is smaller, but the offset for air pollution coming from farming, especially because of the GMO rice that is being grown in countries like Thailand, is massive. And man, I my farm, where I'm building my farm, when I drive to it, I see the fields burning every single day. However, the practice of burning fields in India, in Australia, in different parts of the world goes back 5,000 years. That's how mineralization happened. But that was done once a year. The crop was planted twice. You planted the crop, you burnt, you planted the crop again. However, with your GMOs, and I am experiencing this every single day, I right next to my land where I'm making my regenerative farm, there is another 10 hectares of land where they were growing rice. They, uh, they harvested the rice today, the next morning they came, they cut it. Uh, they cut everything that was left behind. The next morning they came, they burnt it. The next morning they came and they plowed it again. And two days later, they were already sowing. And with, with the crops of, uh, you know, uh, am I allowed to name what is destroying yes, this country? Yes, or of course. Yes, please. With the, with the Monsanto crop and the Cargill uh, fertilizer, you can get up to five rice harvests in a year. 
And Mark, if you're a poor farmer who is living in a village and I came to you and I said, hey, Mark, you know what? Give me your seed, take this seed. Instead of twice, you can grow rice six times this year. That means six ta three times more money you will make this year. Will you, are you willing to do that? You will say yes. And you will take that bait in that moment. And that is what has happened. They have, the, the, the big firms have joined hand, the, like, the likes of the Monsantos, and they have completely centralized farming here. Cargill is the only player in fertilizer. Monsanto is the only player in the seeds. And I'm seeing this with my own eyes because I'm into that business right now. I'm, I'm full-time farming business because my restaurant's been shut in a lockdown on and off for the last 18 months. So I am seeing that with my own eyes. And uh, with when, when me and my business partner were sitting down, we were trying to explain that if we can, with our farm, make it a tried and tested model saying, oh, you have you have an acre of land, you can do poultry, you can do dairy, and you can do farming together, and you would make just as much money that you would make by doing GMO, then we can take this model and give it to every farmer in our area or every farmer in the country. So that is also something that we are developing now, just like the way we developed the prototype of the restaurant of the future with Hauma. That's so beautiful. I'm glad to hear. Now, I absolutely don't have a problem at all. Matter of fact, I had Carrie Gillum as a guest on my show, and she was a big pro proponent against Mo Monsanto. She wrote the book called The Monsanto Papers about yeah. uh, the tra travesties of Monsanto. I've also had um, Ma Maria Rodale of Rodale Institute and Rodale Farms, and she yeah. also wrote a book called The Organic Manifesto. Uh, says horrific things about uh, Bayer and Monsanto, all true, because they are horrific things. We, yeah, uh, yeah. of, of uh, course, I, if you're a poor farmer in yeah. Thailand and you're given the choice of, of struggling and doing one harvest a year or five or six harvests, um, it, that's a hard choice to make uh, of the sustenance of your family. Um, but those are the type of food systems we want to get people away from. We want people to have resilience and strength to push back and say no, to, to diversify, to create regenerative farms with agroforestry and permaculture processes to have biodiverse, multiple harvests, perennials and crops that they can harvest numerous crops and have that resilience and that that stability that they need to get through hard times like this um, uh, and, and not at the cost of our air, not at the cost of human health um, because it's not worth it. And Mark, you know, before we go, went ahead and we started the farm, the first thing we did was as soon as we acquired the land two months ago, the first thing we did was we started planting fruit trees over there and we started planting perennials and shrubs over there and we built an insect hotel and a bee hotel so that flora and fauna in our area could start thriving. So, you know, we started from, we started from a bottom-up approach. And these fruit trees in the future will give fruits that will further give fruit trees, so on and so forth. And our entire area will benefit from it because it is absolutely demoralizing to see that when I drive from the airport to my farm, which is only 10 kilometers away from there, I only see rice and only rice and nothing else. And I see that cycle going on and on and on in the last three or four months that I've, I've been there without the farmer realizing that his yield is pretty much the same. It would be from two harvests if grown right, if not using genetically modified produce. And they would be pretty much making the same money because now there is so much produce that there is, there is crop rationing and they barely get any money for the crops that they grow anymore. So they are still... They are being further pushed down this Hunger Games society that the likes of Monsanto and the buyers have created without really benefiting the farmer because it does not benefit the farmer. It benefits the, the giants, you know? So, so that is something that I am very closely going to be working with. I'm very happy to shoot uh, some uh, pictures and videos to you as well after our call today for you to be able to look at that because I know you love that kind of stuff. So you can take a look at that as well and we can always have the dialogue going. I, I really appreciate that. I've got um, a bunch of questions for you, even more. You know, we're just getting the ball rolling now. Now, we're, now we know who you are. We're now we know what you do. But I, I want to get a little bit more insight. So you're living in, in Bangkok. You're living in Thailand. Yeah. You're from India. Um, yes. 
um, how did that happen? And how does it tie to your feelings of global citizenry or um, this, this world that might function better without nations and borders, divisions of humanity, yep. one from another. If you look at this whole lockdown and the pandemic, the COVID, food was a global citizen. The pandemic yep. was a global citizen. Air, yes. water was all a global <laughs> citizen. But humanity wasn't. Our borders were closed. A lot of nationalism. And, and so I want to get your feelings on, on being a global citizen, but also how did it evolve? How did you go from India to Thailand? And, and, and yeah. how do you feel about this type of a world? Uh, I was the all of 24 years old, then running the, the best Indian restaurant in Mumbai. And when you tell a 24 year old that he has an opportunity to move to Bangkok, uh, that's pretty much period. That's the end of it. Uh, all you can see is uh, a brilliant party life. Uh, but as a chef, that does not really happen. You're still working 16, 18 hours a day. And I moved down over here. I think it was God's will to be able to let me give, a, give me a grand opportunity to be at the executive chef of the Fraser Hotel. And uh, that's how I came here. And I stayed because uh, you've been here multiple times. Uh, Mark, you know, this land has uh, its own charm. It has its own beauty. Uh, two hours drive to a beautiful beach or a four hour drive to some mountains in Chiang Mai. So it had its own charm and it had the charm that my hometown of Allahabad, where the closest airport is Varanasi, is only a two and a half hour flight away. So it was like I could go home for the weekend. You know, it's like uh, it's uh, it, it would take you longer to fly from uh, New York to San Francisco than to go from Thailand to my hometown in India. So, so that's why I stayed. And, and Thailand is very accepting of who you are because of the Buddhist culture that they have over here. And that is something that I really enjoyed. Like when I came to Thailand, they were serving water in a plastic bottle wrapped in a plastic cap with a plastic straw that was inside a plastic and you would get in a plastic bag. And five years later, with all of the noise that we are creating, the movement and the awakening that is happening is disappeared, Ma. You cannot get a plastic bag at a 7-Eleven anymore. You must carry your reusable bags now. You know, so the country is very accepting and moving uh, towards a better tomorrow. Uh, as uh, the pandemic, as you said, the air, the water is a global citizen and humanity is a global citizen too, Mark. I would like to add that. However, the capitalists, are not uh, global citizens. They want us to be, for their profits, for the profits of the those little few, we have to be, uh, we have to be branded through these little books with different colors and emblems of our country that we are, we are, we must carry in our pockets to go anywhere and be anywhere. Uh, is the only uh, thing that I see uh, that, uh, that stops us from being one, you know, and I would like to, I would like to see a world which is free, free for word, free for speech, free for travel, free for uh, ideas, and free for us to be able to really take something that, okay, I saw Marx doing something amazing in Hamburg, Germany, and I want to go ahead and bring it today to Thailand. I should not be waiting for six months in the custom department to be, be, to be able to do something that is better for the country, that is better for the people and humanity at large. So I completely agree with you that that the borders are only and only created for the profits of a few. We are one. Uh, the pandemic has affected everybody just one. And if we work towards a better tomorrow, global warming, for example, it, that, it, it's not like Thailand is warming, but Malaysia is not. Or Malaysia is warming and India is not. It's a global phenomenon. And everything other than our passports has a global identity. And so should we as well. I absolutely agree with you. And, and I like the way that you phrase it. And it's, it's very unique to your personality and, and how you are. And I love to see that view. One, one thing that's really interesting is um, global citizenry or this world without nations or divisions or borders of humanity one from another. Um, and, and especially during this time of the pandemic, this increased nationalism that we've seen rise up in certain countries where they're very fearful of, of others uh, has, yes. been, has been very negative. Um, I, I'm 
I'm originally from the United States, but I've lived in, uh, in Hamburg, Germany now for almost 12 years. And it's, yeah. it's really interesting because Germany was very uh, generous and wonderful for Syrian refugees, climate refugees and conflict refugees, taking right. in uh, lots of lots of them. Europe took in quite a few, but Germany, I believe, was one took in quite a, quite a few. But even in that respect, there was a lot of debate and controversy about do we take them, do we stop our borders and, and things like that. But now something's happened. Um, Germany experienced humongous issues around flooding uh, just recently right. in the last the last yes. uh, few, few weeks. Uh, uh, hundreds of lives have been lost and billions of in, uh, of damage, billions of dollars in, in damage, okay. insurance damage because of, of severe flooding. That flooding and those problems come from poor infrastructure, yeah, poor poor agriculture, using fossil fuels and agriculture, having po air pollution, but also ruining the hummus and the grounds are our, our, our soils to yeah. be able to absorb water and also to having poor infrastructure to not in, instead of buildings or roads have some form of a system in place to handle those type of severe floodings um, right. uh, uh, which is poor infrastructure and now some people might say, well, what does that have to do with refugees? And what does that have to do with climate change? And what does that have to Well, it has a lot to do because those occurred May 2017 was the last time before a few weeks ago that Germany had flooding. And there was a couple hundred of people that died, close to 300 people died. And also yeah. uh, hundred, hundreds of millions of, of flooding damage. And they knew back then what it was and they didn't prepare the infrastructure. They didn't prepare the way they do agriculture. They just continued and now it happened again. And, and so now instead of talking about Syrian refugees or climate refugees or disaster or conflict refugees, those Germans that were bitching and moaning and those people in Europe and in Belgium that just experienced those floodings are now climate refugees themselves because I can guarantee those floodings and those hospitals and those cars and that damage and those farms doesn't get built back tomorrow. It's going to take a few years and those people have been displaced Absolutely. and they become refugees themselves in their own damn country. Absolutely. And so now Absolutely. they should pull their head from their ass. I'm sorry for my language and wake no, up to climate change. This last week, we had the IPCC report come out, the AR6 that says, again, hottest, not telling us anything different. In history. We are in the hottest month in the history of mankind. Yeah, we need to do something. We need to take action. Let's quit debating. Let's quit pointing fingers. Let's quit complaining about refugees. Let's start some action and change our infrastructure. Let's change our gastronomy. Let's change the way we do the food. Let's do it regeneratively. Let's do it within a, a symbiotic planet. Let's do it within the biosphere of our planet and, and in cooperation. And so, as you say in your restaurant, it's this neo-Indian. Yes. There's this, which I love. It's a kind of this nice twist on, on cuisine that I love a lot uh, um but it's also a twist on how our on, on how our world works and it's much different than than your wonderful cuisine but there's a term neoliberalism and neo-darwinism yeah. and that, it basically it, means uh, that natural selection survival of the fittest only the strong survive severe competition that's bullshit. That's not how our world works. Our world works no. in symbiotic relationship, one with another, with nature and our biome. When we cooperate yeah. with each other, when we, we cooperate with nature, when we prepare our infrastructure, our restaurants, our food systems with nature together as partners in collaboration, in cooperation, 
we can live resiliently much longer. Uh, and, and that's how our world works. And we're finally waking up to that, that fact. And I'm just so sad that many people have had to suffer through death and, and hard times to come to that realization. But yeah. I, I think the message, we're done we're done talking about the negative. We're done talking, period. Let's start acting and doing things. And so I, 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 I'm sorry I'm kind of preaching a little bit, but, but I wanted to, to, to get that out and, uh, because I know no, you I have absolutely. strong feelings the same. I completely agree with you. Every single word that you said, you know, uh, the I, the word Neo in front of Indian came from exactly the same idea that you spoke about that we are not, it's not a doggy dog world that we live in. This earth, the mother provides for everybody. There is enough for everybody in there. So we don't have to kill our neighbors to be able to eat a healthy diet. We don't have to, we don't have to go and uh, step on somebody and push somebody down the ladder to be able to be successful because there is somebody for everybody, something for everybody, I mean. And, and, and I, I largely believe that uh, at Haoma, we and at all of my other businesses, I very largely believe that the time to have a dialogue and discussion was yesterday. Today, we need to wake up and we need to take some stern actions because we are fucking up our planet much quicker than the planet thought we would do it to her. So we better get, we, we better, we better be ready for the backlash because I have never heard of the kind of fires that are there in Greece at the moment. Last year, 70% uh, of the land in Australia got burned. There's massive, the hottest temperatures, 49 degrees centigrade recorded in California this year. Like what else does this mankind need to wake up? Do they need their homes, their own homes to be burnt before they wake up? Or are they going to really listen to you and me and or the, the, or, or the likes of us who really want to shake them up and say, hey, start making healthy, wise, planet-driven decisions. Yeah, and, and trust me, it's not hard. You, you've seen, we, uh, the, 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 you and me are doing it. We've been doing it and we've been telling people and we've been changing people's opinions about this for a long time. People at large, all of the viewers here today, I'd like to say this to you, that if you, if you think that your house is not going to get washed in the next flood, then you are mistaken. Make sure that there is no flood. You will not be protected when the, the, the environment comes down on you. So make sure that the decisions that you're taking every single day, when you walk into that supermarket, what bags you're carrying, what decisions you're making every single day, make sure that it is towards a better tomorrow, which is for all of us, not just you. And thinking that somebody else would play, uh, save the planet is the biggest mistake. You have to save the planet for yourself, your children, your family. So please wake up. Yeah, we're, we're all crew members on this spaceship Earth. There are no passengers. There's only a small period of time when we're a baby or when we're very elderly before we pass away, where we're yeah. too frail or too incapable to do anything. But even there, we play a role as a crew member on this Earth to teach other crew members how to treat each other and cooperation with love and respect, but also how to teach us how we need to be good crew members on this spaceship Earth, because we can put our hand on the steering wheel to guide us to the future that we want. And that leads nicely into my next two questions. How, how do you feel? I know you're part of the Chef's Manifesto and uh, yep. food for, Good Food for All, and you're part of the uh, SDG2, uh, No Hunger. And, and, and the advocacy around that with Paul Noonham, uh, who's in Australia, but also has been involved in the UN Food System Summit. Yep. But I really want to know about your feelings about the sustainable development goals and, and what your thoughts and feelings are on there. And also, do you feel like um, they're a roadmap, a goal? Are they uh, good targets to get us to a better future, to keep us at 1.5 degrees of warming and just how maybe you put them into your life or into your restaurant or what your thoughts or feelings are, how just the lay person in Mumbai or the lay person in, in yeah. Thailand, just the general citizen, do they even know what the SDGs are and how can, how would that awareness or just 
thinking differently might help them in a shift. And I kind of want to know your thoughts and feelings on that. Absolutely. So uh, yeah, we've been working very closely with Paul for a while. And uh, Shaft Manifesto has finally been able to actually give guidelines to a lot more younger chefs. I'd like to believe that we got onto this wagon a, a little bit earlier, but uh, the wagon has still not left the station. The wagon is right there. And with uh, the likes of uh, gentlemen like Paul, who are actually showing the light through this tunnel to a lot more people. We are busy in our daily lives, but he has committed his own life to be able to give them the give them the guidelines towards how we can get this together by bringing people like myself and other chefs together who are examples of how we can achieve this at the same time, be successful, be world renowned, be profitable, but still be working towards a better tomorrow. And 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 SDGs, uh, you know, uh, uh, Mark, uh, I'd like to believe that they are great for, uh, you know, uh, with no disrespect, they are great for the educated classes. They are great for people who are awake like you and me. But a layman, he has, he probably has no idea of what is happening into the environment. He has, uh, oh, it's just, oh, uh, there was a flash flood. Ah, there must have been a cloud burst. Over, okay, wait for the government to take some action. So, to be able to instill this into their into their uh, program, into their windows of their brain, we have to go to the grassroots level. And children in young, young, young ages have to be compulsively go through this strict regime of knowing, okay, you cannot, they have to be told what decisions to make, Mark. I don't think children need to learn about uh, what battles Napoleon won in the 1400s. They should, which we were being taught in school as a 13 year old, but rather never taught of how we could protect or benefit our environment and our mother earth. So I think the goals that are set, the SDGs are great for the educated classes like you and me, but at the grassroots level, we need to go down deeper and we need to be able to educate the budding citizens of our world. So it's a kind of an eco-literacy and environmental uh, lit literacy that needs to occur, and I agree with you. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I'm, I'm totally with you, and I think that there's another way. I mean, I don't, I, I talk about the SDGs a lot as well, but um, yes. I think what we also talk about daily things that people do interaction with food and the environment that also without saying it directly touches on all of the SDGs but in a different way that some some people can understand how right. they can live yep. life differently and I think that's really uh, a really important way to do it you coming from Mumbai very hot place Thailand's a very hot place the California is extremely hot now certain areas of the world are extremely hot now and I've and I've been in conversations with some people from these areas. They they're not getting that it's climate change, that it's our environment getting hotter. It's exactly. just like, oh, that's that's weird that it's so hot. It's a record again. Um, somehow they're missing that link of connection and then they go right back to their daily lives yeah it's hot uh, the forests are burning the uh it's hotter than ever people are dying uh okay yeah. i gotta go back to work and, and it's business as usual those two yeah. things to for me don't correlate how can you not see that correlation and that relationship yeah, mark you know the urgency that they have shown with the COVID pandemic the lockdowns they, I am telling you today, and mark my word that you, this will be on video. I, the speed at which they're going, suddenly there is going to be a wake up call, and the government is going to shove this down their throat. There's going to be, there's going to be climate change lockdowns. People will not be allowed to get out of their homes because the cities near them are burning. And this is going to happen in the near future. It's going to happen tomorrow. I know one of the greatest three-star Michelin restaurants in America, Medwood, got burnt and gone in California in the last fire. The entire village got wiped out. Who would have thought? People, they were spending $400, $500 a dinner over there, lining up, uh, booking three, six months out in advance. It's gone. It's disappeared. It hasn't come back into existence. 
you know so i think people uh, we live in a world where we only understand the pain once the pain is inflicted upon us you know we, we don't want to learn by somebody else's example we don't want to learn by what happened in australia last year we are still we are not we, our, our media does not want to emphasize upon the fact that greece is burning at the moment or turkey is burning at the moment you know or it does not want to emphasize on the fact that more than 600000 people are trying to leave kabul tonight because the taliban is taking over you know so it, we live in a world which is fucking weird but at the same time i'm not giving hope on it i i i i still want to drive to a better tomorrow because i have hope and i have faith that we can do this i i do too and and um i I've had a few meals with you and I know your level of standard of eating and and it is important uh, to me because what better way than through connection of one human being to another and good food that is sustainable and healthy and makes Absolutely. you feel good and in a restaurant, in an environment, or in a farm where the air quality is better because there's trees and there's healthy soil that's capturing the carbon, the, the food that are, is not highly processed with sugars, aromas, and flavors, yep. and chemicals, but it's good to eat, that there's no better thing in the world to do, and it's something that each of us do each and every single day, and it's something that we can all can contribute to human suffering, to, to the health of our food, but also to our environmental destruction, because it's Absolutely. Not just the fossil fuel industry, the automotive, the chemical industry, that are the number one creators of greenhouse gas emissions and our global warming. They're on the list, don't get me wrong, but the number one factor creating the biggest impact on human suffering and global warming in our environment is agriculture, seafood, agriculture. food and beverage. Food. We, we do it every day. It's food. Absolutely. And, and the packaging, the waste on and on, et cetera. It's, and it's also the biggest silver bullet to draw down and fix the problem. And it's a beautiful thing. It's, it, it's such a nice thing to do when we connect ourselves. I have the hardest question for you uh, that I'm gonna give for you today. And it's the burning question, WTF. And no, it's not the swear word, although we've probably been saying it several times these past two years. Um, it's actually, What's the futures? What what do we have to look forward to? What is your vision? I want to know your vision yeah. of what's the futures. Where should we go? Why should we go there? And what's the roadmap? I think, uh, Mark, the only possible way from my and I'm no I, I am no guru. I'm no I'm no uh, political pundit. But I can tell you this: that from my vision, from where I see as a 32 year old, is that. The only way to survive what is coming ahead of us in the midst of this disease, in the midst of this global warming, in the midst of the depletion of our environment, we need to be able to form communities. We need to be able to live as a community. And we need to be able to bring like-minded people together who have empathy. Empathy, with empathy, I don't only mean, oh, you just, you, you pet a, 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 a stray dog or, or, or you help an old lady cross the road. Empathy for nature. Empathy for your neighbor. You know, your empathy for the environment. We need to come together and we need to say, okay, we are going to build food systems of our own. And we are not going to rely on the commercial systems. And I personally believe that that is going to be the future. Community service agreements, CSA, is the future of where people come together and the, 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 the irony is that the future is the past because that's exactly how it happened back in the day, right, Mark? You would step out and there would be a, 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 a small trailer truck and the back of the truck would be loaded with vegetables and your aunt and your mom would step out of the house and buy it whatever he brought today to sell on the back of his trailer truck, right? And that was community. And it was the same guy coming in every day, whatever was in the farms and he was sourcing, he was selling it. that is what we need to go we don't we suddenly don't need to have the need to eat wagyu beef frying from japan and germany neither do we need to eat caviar flown from france to bangkok we need to wake up today when we travel 
and go to these places a couple of times a year, we can definitely do that. But having massive shipping containers fly that produce to be able to consume on a daily basis from supermarkets is not the need. We do not need to consume things that are not in that region and that is not local war. I think community that is local war driven is the answer to most of the problems is how I feel about it. I love it. I have three three more questions left and then we're done. Please go ahead. Uh, and th they're really for my guests, for, for my listeners, I guess, not my guests. Um, if there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? And it's okay if it's a couple messages, but what's, what's a sustainable takeaway for them that really would have the power to change their life? I believe you've already answered it in some respects by saying, you know, grow your own food, take control yep. of your, your energy source back. But, but uh, please, I want to hear it from you. I just, to all of the listeners today, the only thing that I want to say, and I think uh, what your takeaway should be is that please do not wait for somebody else to save the environment. Please wake up today and go out there and to be able to adapt and make the right decisions, adapt to the right food systems. And you all deep down inside know that there are people like me and Mark out there who have laid the guidelines on our websites, on our, on our channels. Just pay heed to us and you'll be able to know what decisions to make. The road to sustainable living is not very hard. It's very, very simple and very rewarding. And you can get on this today as soon as you end this podcast. Great. What should young chefs or innovators, entrepreneurs in your field be thinking about if they are looking for ways to make a real impact on their community, on their life? Uh, Mark, I think uh, all, of the, all of the young chefs and all of the uh, food entrepreneurs that are listening to me today, what I want to tell you is that please, please look beyond acknowledgement. The first two years that I was doing this, nobody knew who I was. Don't look for instant gratification. Focus on what you think is right and make sure that it is ethical. And once you do work towards a better environment, a better food system, a better food industry, you will be heard. And age and everyone will be heard. You need to know that it's not about how good your food looks on the plate or how delicious it takes. This, it is about nurturing the diners. Nurture your diners. Make sure that after they've eaten the, your food, they will wake up better, healthier tomorrow. And the last question is, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start that might have, you know, man, if I would have known this about sustainability or this it would have changed your life. Is there anything like that? Yeah, uh, if I had known that, uh, if I had known and people wouldn't have uh, uh, made sustainability, sustainability and living sustainability and running a sustainable restaurant sound like rocket science, it would have been easier uh, for me to adopt this much earlier. Most of the people, I've got to tell you, and please go ahead and look up Haoma and see the sustainability page on our website. You'd see the amount of sustainability we do. Uh, all of that that you will see on our website, uh, and all of those beautiful systems that we've made, DIY, have costed us less than $20,000. So it is not ex expensive to go sustainable. It is rewarding to go sustainable. And I wish I knew this way in advance. Yeah, you would have started sooner. DK, yeah. thank you so much for letting us inside of your ideas. It has been a sheer pleasure. It's always wonderful to talk to you. It's good to see you again. And I, I can't wait to, to see you again. And and give you a hug and also eat at your restaurant uh, in Bangkok very soon. Please have a wonderful Absolutely. day. May we meet again soon, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank Bye -bye. you.